Hello and welcome everyone. We'll give a few minutes for everything to get started and for people to log in. All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this event, um, for this assignment on the High Level Dialogue on Energy's Ministerial Forum. I'm Meredith Adler, and I'm the Executive Director of Student Energy Global. I'm joining you today from the territory of the Washoe people in North America. Today and every day, it's important that we recognize the first peoples of the land and local communities and their leadership as we work to transition to a sustainable energy future. It's also an incredibly exciting day here for student energy. As an organization, we've spent the last 12 years working to empower young people, help them build the skills that they need and, the, and unite with the community of both mentors and peers that they need to be motivated to take on the challenges of shaping our sustainable energy future. As an organization that's been at this for a little while, we've always had one dream. And that's to be able to really fully fund and launch all of the different initiatives that young people have that we know can accelerate our sustainable energy transition. Today, we're here to launch the Solutions Movement. We're so excited to tell you more about it. But before I do, I'd love to thank UN Energy, Sustainable Energy for All, and UNDP for having us here today. And I'd like to welcome As Asser Barling, the Head of Department for Global Climate Action at the Ministry of Energy, uh, climate and Utilities for Denmark to share some words with us. Thank you very much uh, and thank you for allowing me to uh, speak at this event. Uh, and first of all, uh, allow me to congratulate you and Student Energy on the announcement of the Youth uh, Solutions Movement. Uh, this kind of ambition demonstrated by this initiative to support 10,000 youth-led clean energy projects by 2030 is precisely what we need in order to accelerate the energy transition and achieve SDG 7. So Denmark is therefore proud to be a founding partner to this initiative. Uh, accounting for around 75% of global emissions, the energy sector is the largest contributor to climate change. And it is obvious that we need a major system with transformation, it is a system-wide transformation of our energy systems. As student uh, energy research have shown, young people are eager and ready to play a key role in this transformation. However, many currently lack the necessary skills and resources to develop and implement climate solutions. In order to realize the potential for innovation and job opportunities that the energy transition provides, it is therefore critical to empower youth by supporting them, by supporting you in the best ways possible. Since 2020, uh, Denmark has supported student energy's ecosystem work on clean energy entrepreneurship and local capacity building in developing countries. We are very pleased to see the, that the support given by Denmark has contributed to inspiring and enabling the development of the youth solutions movement, which is a very concrete and scalable way to aim uh, to address this gap. Student energy strength lies in the fact that it is an organization by youth, for youth, and is present and active in so many countries across the world. This places you, places student energy in a unique position to understand and address the needs of young people who are motivated to create an equitable energy system that is catered to the need of future generations. Tackling climate change is the biggest challenge of our time and it will not be easy, but seeing the motivation, innovation, creativity and drive that young people around the world today uh, are showing that all that all in all gives me hope that we will achieve our goals so you can count on denmark's continued support and we invite others to also support this important and visionary movement we look very much forward to seeing you all for the official launch of the youth solutions movement at the high level dialogue in september i wish you best of luck 
and thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Meredith. And with that, <laughs> and with that I'll tell you all a little bit more about the initiative. But first of all, we would like to sincerely thank Denmark for their support. It means so much to have supporters who really believe in youth-led initiatives and the power of young people to change the energy future. And we're so excited to have you as the first official supporter of the Solutions Movement. Moving on, I'll give you a little bit more context as to what we're here to do today. It's Student Energy's goal to launch $150 million of financing to support youth-led energy projects from here to 2030 to do our part to contribute to achieving SDG 7. It's important that we both help young people to build the skills that they need to take on energy system challenges, but also that we're funding their work so that they're not facing um, undue barriers as they try to take on some of their biggest challenges in their communities and work together with other generations to make this happen. What we're seeing is quite a large challenge in front of young people, but there's a large role that governments can play. From our Global Youth Energy Outlook, what we know is that over 50% of youth have never been engaged in a conversation by a government, company, or organization on what it is that they want for the future of the energy system. We also know that 83% of young entrepreneurs face challenges getting their first funder, and often it can take five to 10 years to get their first initial um, movement off the ground. We also know that 74% um, of young people who have participated in climate protests that we've all found to be so inspiring and such a great call to action are struggling to find other ways to mobilize um, solutions in their communities and need better pathways to make this happen. And finally, we know that this is a large challenge with innovation funding and energy funding as only 45 billion of the $455 billion worth of climate finance crosses borders between OECD and non-OECD countries. But today we're here to talk about all those solutions, those, these challenges. We're really excited to be celebrating this with UN Energy and really commend them for making youth such a central part of what we came to do here today. You'll notice that throughout the agenda, young innovators are baked into every piece of this ministerial. And that's really a first for, you, for most UN activities on energy. And so we'd like to commend them for taking this step. But without further ado, what we're here to do is unpack the case behind why we need to launch the solutions movement. And I'm so excited that we're joined today by all of the people who inspired us to do this work. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, Helen Watts, our Global Director of Partnerships, who's joined by some amazing young innovators <laughs> and our lead champion, Danny Kennedy, um, to explain what we're doing and why we need to do it and how we can all work together to make the solutions movement happen faster. Helen? Thanks so much, Meredith. Um, and uh, really couldn't have said it any better. We're so excited to be here today. This is a huge movement, huge moment for our movement, our global movement, but really the global movement to achieve SDG 7. More broadly, um, the potential to unlock uh, youth-led action is so untapped and has so much potential. And so we'll be diving a little bit deeper into what that actually means in real terms. Um, and like Meredith said, you know, these, this panel is really made up of the people who have inspired us. Um, young people kind of leading work in the field themselves. Um, Danny, who's really championed this whole initiative from the get-go. And so um, I'm delighted to welcome them uh, to this panel discussion and we'll dive right in. Um, so I'll just do a quick welcome of who we have on this panel discussion today. Um, and then we'll dive into some questions. Um, the questions will kind of allow you also to share a little bit more about your work and what you do, um, which will be great for the audience to hear as well. So we're joined here today by Danny Kennedy, who's the CEO of New Energy Nexus. Um, we're joined as well by Isha um, Kulkarni, associate at RMI India, um, as well as Eduardo Zogbi, uh, the energy and gender consultant at Sustainable Energy for All. Um, and last but certainly not least, Kevin Shima, the co-founder and CEO at Umuti Packaging. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Um, it's great. We've got, you know, people joining in from all over the world. So I think it'll be a really um, great and enriching conversation. Um, so I'll start with you, Danny. I'll put you on the spot here. So you lead New Energy Nexus, as we know, and your audacious goal is to launch 100,000 clean energy businesses. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why, why a goal of 100,000 energy businesses? Where did that number come from? And what do you see the role of young people in helping you to achieve that? Thank you, and, and thanks for having me. It's really exciting. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I am calling in from... Uh, 
Eora Nation in Australia, uh, and want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. Um, and to say, I'm really excited to be talking to the future leaders of the solutions movement. Why 100,000 startups this decade, which is our goal at New Energy Nexus? The answer is simply that this is the decade to deploy the solutions that we have at hand to the climate crises. And the good news is, you know, we do have solutions. Uh, that's kind of like one of the, the problems that humans have around the availability heuristic. We think we're living in the 20th century and still burning coal and, and oil to do everything. Whereas actually over the last couple of decades, we've really started to scale solutions and solar in particular has become the dominant new generation capacity in the electricity grids in the world. The electrification of uh, transport is happening at speed and scale, you know, of two wheel vehicles sold last year, 75 million of them in COVID, 24 million or so were electric. So a third of the, the two wheel vehicle platforms of the world were already electrified, but we need to do 100% of those vehicles in the world. And uh, to do that, we need small businesses to begin and start selling and grow large and become very successful. And likewise, to deploy 100% of solar as new generation, not just uh, the, the majority of it each year, year on year. We need to do about $2 trillion worth of sales and deployment of solar, wind, storage, electric vehicles, electric appliances. We need to switch out the fuse boxes and the induction stoves. And we need to do all the things and electrify the lives of a billion people on earth that currently don't enjoy it and will be born into a world where they don't have what we all take for granted, which is electricity. All of which is work, all of which is good, all of which is economic in terms of its total cost is less than the option to go with fossil fuels or the kerosene lamps or whatever, but it requires businesses to do it. So I'm giving you a long-winded answer, Helen, to say we need lots and lots and lots of companies. And we've calculated that in the innovation stakes, you know, the bits where there is new stuff to be invented or ingenious combination of existing business models with finance and technology, we need about 100,000 startups this decade to really catalyze the scale of energy transition that we need in critical markets to the climate outcome, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And of those 100,000, obviously, many of them need to be youth led. They're gonna last for decades, these businesses. They're gonna require the motivation and, and energy of young people to really disrupt the markets and categories and overtake the incumbent businesses that they're gonna challenge. Um, and so through the magic of private enterprise and, and public support and public private partnerships, we believe we can spawn all these businesses, but we want young leaders to fill the roles where honestly, bluntly, folk like me, 50 and above are not doing it. And so we've been very excited at New Energy Nexus, the world's largest platform to support startups in this space, to partner with student energy, to think through guided entrepreneurship, to look at how do you get a student energy idea and turn it into a small business on a campus and then take it to market and commercialize a technology or build a real business in the community and, and get it to scale, which is the game we're gonna to have to play 10,000 times or 100,000 times over uh, together over the next decade. Absolutely. Yeah. And no, really well put. I mean, a couple of the threads that really stand out for me there is, um, you know, this by getting young people engaged in this, like that's our key to sustaining this over the next decade. And that's really, that's a huge part of why the why youth argument. Um, but also this is a really huge opportunity for youth to access meaningful projected jobs and work opportunities and become entrepreneurs and kind of have successful businesses in a market that's just waiting and needs that. Um, so that's really exciting. And a lot of these solutions already exist is kind of the part that always really kind of strikes me is, you know, we're not always talking about brand new innovations here. Like there are best case practices that just need to be scaled and deployed. Um, and so young people getting boots on the ground there is, is such an exciting, it's going to be an exciting decade for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So maybe um, Isha, I'll turn over to you um, because you've done a lot of thinking on how to break down doors for more innovation opportunities for young people to contribute to real energy challenges faced by communities around the world. 
um, especially in you know countries like India where you live. Um, and in your experience, where do you see the greatest need from young people to launch clean energy and projects in their communities? Where does that kind of window really open up for young people? Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, so I'm Isha, I'm an associate at RMI India, and a lot of my work focuses on how policies and business models can mobilize finance for the energy transition in sectors like transport, industries, buildings. And I think firstly, uh, as everyone said, I mean, there's just so many challenges, just a multitude of challenges that you um, that come when you think about this intersection of innovation, finance, and bring in young people into that. Um, as has already been pointed out, the solutions, the need for solutions has never been more pron pronounced, but I think also that all of them already exist. We know that the global South is responsible for the least amount of climate change while also being the most vulnerable to it. We're also already experiencing uh, so much extreme weather and all this infrastructure collapse, not just, a pub not just like built environment, but also power systems. Um, and at every level, especially at the final mile, countries are really struggling to transition their energy systems. But also young people are the closest to the grassroots, closest to understanding those real local challenges, uh, more sensitive to the needs of the communities. And I think this is really the biggest need and also the unspoken opportunity that I see um, from the kind of activism that also has been mentioned that we've seen over the last few years to the amount of um, COVID relief efforts that I've seen a lot of young people around me have led. No one can deny that young people are adept at mobilizing communities and organizing this entire large scale movements. And since we already mentioned that the solutions already exist, right? Um, much of the technology already exists, yes, but it needs to reach the final mile. And especially in the global South, youth can play that role in understanding their communities, um, understanding the local systems, what works, what doesn't work, connecting those dots and helping scale the clean energy projects, the level that they need to be at. Um, so I think that's really where I come from. Yeah, I know that's great. And absolutely, I mean, um, the some of those thematic roadmaps for the high level dialogue on energy um, are coming out this week, and I think there's a couple a couple of those where there really is this kind of understanding that you know adoption still remains a huge barrier to scaling energy access, and young people often are these trusted community members. Um, they can build kind of a willingness to pay. They can really build adoption mentalities in their communities. So. Um, absolutely. I think, yeah, you put that really well, Isha, um, that it's just, again, like another la layer of that untapped potential is really activating young people as these community, community enablers, community adopters. Um, so that's really exciting as well. And, uh, and Kevin, maybe I'll turn to you next, because you're a young entrepreneur yourself dealing with the challenges of trying to access funding to kind of scale the next level of your business. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your personal experience as a young entrepreneur, um, trying to fundraise as a young entrepreneur as well, and, and what the big bar biggest barriers you, um, you faced uh, have been that, that might apply to other young entrepreneurs moving into this field? Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. So like uh, I'm a CEO of the Umuti, a company which uh, uh, upcycles a uh, barrel plant and trunks into paper bags. So my journey for accessing like fundings has been hard. And especially for African entrepreneurs, it's so, 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 so hard. So for my startup, we have been having a, a dozens and dozens of rejections. And until now, we have never even been able to win like a competition because that's the easy way of getting even fundings. So during that like journey, we adopted to what you call 3F for startups. So which is like the only way you can get like investment easily. Those three F are family, friend, and foolish because those are the only people who can put money in your business. Through those three F, we have been able to prototype and do some small progress. But after that, it was time to reach out to investors because this, like, this area is so capital intensive. So reaching out to investors is one of the hardest thing to ever do in life. Because from my own experience, like investors I've met, like some will be telling me that your solution is not going to make it or why has it not been done before? Or let's keep in touch and we can catch up later after you have like some tra traction. There's one who like, <laughs> like uh, it was, uh, I had to swallow. Like he told me like, uh, stop focusing on the business, go and focus on your studies uh, and focus on your family, get a girlfriend and like have a life because this is not going to happen. So I spent like almost two days thinking about that only phase because it's what it was hard to to swallow so 
this journey has like shaped me and made me a strong person, but it's it's all about two people, two players in, in the game. It's an investor and a founder. And from all the sectors, what I have learned for the founders. So there's something people don't like take into consideration, but this is the like the like it's it's like an uh, something I can give to to founders. The first thing is all about money has no emotions. So all of us as like startups, we always have that good story. And we are always saying that we are going to save the world. We are going to do bring something back to the community. But we never think about sustainability and growth of our business. And what happens if that community are serving, it happens that you burn out. They are not going to like give you money back. I'm not saying that squeeze money from the community and make them uh, uh, make them poor. I'm saying that uh, make impact and make money, make money because you have to have a, a sustainability. So for investors, why well, I can say for the investors, like I want to like tell everyone who is here and or everyone who knows an investor, tell them to come and invest in Africa. Like this century, I saw like, uh, uh, I, I have been seeing this. There's a, a, an app which is for plant lovers, which was able to raise like 5 million USD. I know plant lovers is a big thing that there's a lot of plant lovers in the US. That's where the, the business works. But like there are business in Africa, startups in Africa, which are providing like electricity for hospitals, which are saving lives, which are even struggling to raise 500. For my own business, we are not even being able to raise 100, like thousand for even doing our business. And for the moment, there are 100, you have to do prototyping, research and development, like for even 15,000, which is somehow hard to even have as an entrepreneur and you don't have any choice every like investor is going to come to you're you going to accept it because there's no any other way out so the two it's a hard battle and it's a hard journey for in like, for entrepreneurs and if you think it's going to be easy my friend you, sh you should leave it thank you thanks so much kevin and i mean i honestly feel like even sharing these types of experiences with other young people who are thinking about going down the same journey and really sharing, you know, what you've learned, like whether it's the three F's or you're going to have to have a lot of resoluteness to keep kind of pushing yourself forward beyond the barriers. Like that's a really important message to share out to just really build this sense of kind of solidarity around the experience of being a young entrepreneur working in the space. And the more we can kind of share and showcase these barriers and opportunities to overcome barriers like youth inclusive finance, for example, um, I think it really serves to kind of send signals to the larger international community as well, that this is an area that needs to be really seriously addressed. And it's, it's again, an opportunity to, um, to scale these larger agendas. So no, I really appreciate you sharing some of those, uh, some of those insights from the field. I know there's a question that's popped up in the chat directed at you, Kevin, as well. So we'll circle back to that question if that's okay. Um, but for now, I'm going to move on to uh, Eduarda, because um, I really want to hear more about um, your work, which has really been focused on the intersection of gender and energy, which really underlines how SDG 7, achieving affordable, clean, reliable energy access for all, ties into the entire sustainable development agenda. Um, and what do you feel like are some of the biggest barriers for young women working to launch projects and businesses that are, are a little bit more unique or maybe have a layer that, that is quite different um, than the broader experience? Um, and maybe as a second part to that question, what can organizations such as Student Energy in the global community um, do or focus on to, to bridge those gaps? Well, thank you for a question, Helen. And also thank you for inviting me to join the conversation today. It's a huge honor. Um, and I think that to answer your question, when we talk about gender barriers in the energy sector, we have to recognize that they exist in all levels of the energy supply chain and in all, and in all sectors. So um, before even thinking what are the barriers for young women entrepreneurs, we have to consider that um, it's even hard to get them interested in the energy sector in the first place. So I think that the number one thing would be the lack of information because um, it's not common for young women to be you know, in college and high school developing this interest in the energy sector. And most of us, and correct me if I'm wrong, but have somehow you know, landed in the energy sector because we were interested in climate change and maybe in the renewable energy sector. And we didn't really have someone taking us there unless we maybe did an internship or you know, had some sort of experience related to that. So I think that you know, um, having uh, 
you know, dissemination of information when women are growing up is very important because we do know that there is this belief that uh, women should not be engineers, uh, that, they're, that they don't identify as someone who can be working in energy because it's a male dominated sector. So I think that breaking these stereotypes at an early age is extremely important. Um, and then I think that the number two barrier is the lack of role models. Um, so even, so as Kevin was saying, it's already so hard to be an entrepreneur. And then for women, you barely even know that there are other women entrepreneurs uh, doing something that you would love to do. So you immediately feel like disencouraged to start doing something that you're passionate about. So I think that having role models is very important. And the good, the good news is that they're out there. And then again, they're not highlighted enough. So if you start like browsing names in the internet, you will find that there are energy and uh, uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, both from the global north and global south that have done amazing work. But as long like, you know, I feel like if we don't give them enough space and a platform to share their ideas, they will never be recognized. So I think that highlighting this, these women is very important to, uh, you know, to boost more confidence in, um, in other women and all parts of the world who think that they will not be able to get there and to effectively, you know, pursue a career in this sector. Um, and then maybe number three barrier, in my opinion, would be obviously mentorship, but not mentorship, just, you know, pairing someone um, with, um, with another person who's doing something similar in the, um, in the sector, but also mentorship in like what type of skills are necessary to develop your own business. That's incredibly important because um, I think it's definitely not easy. There are uh, financial constraints and also regulatory constraints in many countries that being an entrepreneur, not only at a young age is hard, but also like the amount of taxes and like registering your brand. This is all like a lot of bureaucracy that has to be like overcome by the government most of the time. Um, and then when it comes to like what organizations could do, I think Student Energy is already doing an incredible job not only by creating a network that brings together people, you know, like Ish and Kevin that, you know, have different types of experiences and are from different countries to show that, you know, it's possible. Um, and in different, you know, um, uh, co coming from, you know, different sectors and being uh, uh, different practitioners, but, uh, and also I think that, that then just bringing the, the importance of the global compact and like, uh, I was going through some energies, global compact and seeing like, you know, the commitment of deploying $150 million uh, for mentoring, as I was saying, uh, and financing early and mid-stage youth-led uh, uh, clean energy initiatives is very important. And also the advocacy that is being done. I think that we talk a lot about not having a seat at the table. And then when you have an organization of energy that represents, you know, global youth, being able to advocate for the importance of finance for for energy, for youth-led energy uh, entrepreneurship is very important. Uh, and then just to maybe uh, finalize by saying that the global community has to champion more women, as I was saying about the importance of highlighting these women. So in all high-level events, we need to have a space to, to, to share what you know young women are doing, uh, not only as entrepreneurs, but overall in the energy sector, because they're out there. Sometimes we don't know the numbers, we don't have the, the information, the statistics, but they're out there doing a lot of amazing work. And in terms of you know, financing, I would just give an example of what SC for All has done and this year that I think is you know, a start. You know, we're planting the seed uh, to, you know, to offer more finance for young people uh, is that during our youth summit this year, which is, was our first one, we had a session about uh, troubleshooting SDG seven where we invited youth everywhere to submit solutions. Uh, for SDG 7, and we awarded uh, $2,500 uh, for, the, for the winners who are doing a project in cold storage, uh, solar powered cold storage for COVID-19 vaccines, which is incredible. But, you know, just the fact, it, it might not sound like a lot of money, but, you know, coming from the global south, myself, uh, $2,500 is a lot. And sometimes it will make a difference between a young person saying yes or no, on following you know, the solution that they believe in. So I think that we need the global community to recognize that maybe even very small grants uh, will make a huge difference uh, into having young people really being entrepreneurs or not. Absolutely, yeah. And it kind of comes back to what Kevin was saying as well about you know just getting to that first level of like 15,000 is so challenging. You know, like we, we've seen that through our greenpreneurs um, social enterprise incubator as well is that, you know, 
offering grants that are around like the 5,000 USD mark, like that is a huge, that's a huge gap in the funding landscape. And so, yeah, it really is the difference of either starting it and really being able to kind of dedicate the time and commitment to just getting that prototype um, off the ground or starting to do kind of community testing versus, you know, dropping off and starting a job somewhere else where it feels a little bit more secure and stable. So no, absolutely. I think it's a great point and a great point as well around by when the international community, like an institution like SE for all or like student energy demonstrates and makes public, you know, we're willing to put money directly into the hands of young people. Like that's a huge de-risking mechanism in and of itself, right? Because it's, it's really showcasing that, you know, the international community and certain actors trust young people with capital to lead solutions. It's not something that's like we're seeing as, as overly high risk, um, which our goal is really that this can send, send larger shifts, signal shifts um, throughout the community. So I'm excited about that as well. Awesome. So we'll circle back to some questions for the whole group. Um, and actually, Kevin, maybe I'll circle back to you first, because uh, we had a question in the chat here for you. Um, and if anybody else wants to jump in and, and speak to this as well, um, at this point, we'll kind of make this a collective discussion. Um, so the need for capital is clear. Are there any resources or support that you need to launch your clean energy business? Um, so Kevin, specifically in your context, and then if anybody else has anything to kind of add to this as well. Yeah, definitely there are other more. So for my business, every time there's this analogy I, I, I like to use. So every time you're going to start a business, it's like you are new to that sector. I call it you are a baby who is raising a baby. So what is the need of giving someone a money to raise your baby to buy a diaper when you don't even know how to put it together, when you don't even know how to give the, the kid the milk? So there's a need of even more of the skills, the side of the skills, and there's also a need of patience in people you are putting money in. So most of investors want to put money there and they expect like high returns at that moment. Just there's a need of patience, relax, and also give these young people skills to put the diaper on, skills to do the hair and all those stuff. That's, that's the two most important thing, I think, from my own end. Yeah, that's really well put. <laughs> giving a baby money to raise a baby. <laughs> awesome, um, that's great. So another question maybe for the full group, um, this initiative aims to build an army of solutions implementers globally. Um, what are the most important challenges for young people to focus on right now in the energy landscape in, in order to achieve SDG seven? Um, are there any maybe like more underrated or less, um, you know, less kind of shiny solutions that don't get talked about as much as they should be um, when it comes to really scaling action uh, on SDG 7? Or which ones kind of are the most exciting to you personally? So I think let me go first. So I'll be basing my everything on Africa because that's where I am from. So the existence of like African problems, like are the ones which like African youth are not focusing on. And like Africans, if there's something which is new, it's like, let's make apps, payment apps, let's make like uh, ordering apps. But why are we going to make those when these people don't have electricity and don't have water? So the big thing which I've seen is like the new oil is the solar energy is the new oil for the whole Africa. And if like, let's get an example on the SDGs. We have 17 SDGs. And if you take a look on the SDGs, six of them are on the climate area. Think about like half, like half of those SDGs are on the climate. So we are focusing on others, but the big problem, if you see it, is on the, on, on the climate. So taking back to my community, I know some hospitals which cannot work in the evening because they don't have electricity. I know some hospitals which don't have a good water to give their people. I know some kids who are struggling to, to learn and there's a lot of more. It's not about my community, it's about the African problem. If we take a look, let's take a look uh, on the Nigerians problem. So many of them, they think it's race and other things, but these conflicts are ideally on the like in, in climate part. Like if you look at what we like the, like the problem which is happening in, in Nigeria, if we take like deep down to the problem, it's all about the Delta like area there, which is there's a lot of things there. If you go to Congo, that's the same thing. There are even more countries which are having the same things. Like for us, like our generations, like how I normally say, so our generations are like social media generations. So let's do an example for the current generations. You will not find someone on Facebook at the age of 18 to 23 
because that's Facebook is for the old people. You find them in Instagram and Snapchat. This entry, we are going for the clubhouse because that's the new things. So these people are jumping to solutions they are see which is popular, something they see which is easier, but we need people to emphasize on this climate thing. If we have six like goals in the SDGs, it shows you how important it is for the whole world to focus on the climate area. Thank you. Everyone unmuted at the same time. I'm just gonna be, make a <laughs> brief comment. I think that in terms of uh, underrated solutions, I just wanted to also bring the, uh, the idea that SDG 7 is not only about renewable energy, but I think that energy efficiency is incredibly important. But I'm actually gonna talk about sustainable cooling, which is something that SFL has been you know, uh, discussing worldwide is the importance of like, how are we going to be you know, resilient to the fact that we're going to have heat waves more and more often. And you know the lack of refrigeration has been uh, shown to, has been proven to be a huge problem for COVID nineteen storage uh, COVID nineteen vaccine storage. So I think that um, uh, I have I've definitely seen a lot of young people being innovators in renewable energy and maybe even energy efficiency. But I think that you know thinking about cooling chains is very important. And if there are young people listening to us now that want to do something in the in this area. Uh, and the solutions are sometimes even easier and cheaper than we imagine. So there are solutions that are related to, you know, reflective rooftops. So just like painting them white already makes a big difference and planting trees. And we, I feel like we always underestimate also the role of nature-based solutions in tackling climate change. So, um, and also thinking about how to make appliances more efficient, you know, everywhere in the world, not only in the global South, but also in the global North. Uh, so I think that cooling alternatives will be, you know, the next big thing and something to uh, that young people should be thinking about for their futures. Helen, yeah, I, I'll just jump in to to say ditto to what Eduarda and and Kevin have just said about broader climate innovations and and cooling as a really important sector. Just on um, sort of classic energy services, electricity and mobility. I think there's a lot of opportunity for youth-led businesses in the electrification of transport fleets at the base of the pyramid that integrates closely with renewable generation, you know, using two-wheel and four-wheel vehicles and buses and things as assets on a distributed grid is kind of happening around the world. And we're seeing in, in East Africa, the electrification of Boda Boda as an example, the motorbike taxis that drive around many countries using hot swappable battery stations as a, a productive end use in microgrids that help uplift the economics of the microgrid developers, you know, by having a, a consistent demand center, the, the load of the charging for the battery stations means that those microgrids can perform better, more optimally, and that that grid then has inbuilt storage. And, and around the world, it's the same that we're sort of realizing we've got batteries on wheels at scale coming in with these motorbikes and cars being sold around the world. And, you know, young people are famous for building the businesses and the chop shops and the car culture and the fast and the furious and the folk that, you know, do the things with cars and motorbikes and, and mobility services um, in Indonesia you know, we're, we're running a hackathon actually this month around electric mobility. And, you know, that's a massive young nation of aspiring youthful people. We had 13,000 folk turn up to a educational event on Instagram live to make Kevin's point about the social media generation, just to learn what a hackathon is and how to get involved in an entrepreneurial program and, and sort of look at the, different business model options and areas that they could maybe get involved in electrification of, of vehicles in Indonesia, which is a very important part of the solution, but also in that country, getting the, the tens of millions of people still without energy access served by using the bikes literally as an asset in the microgrids in the islands that will serve them. Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, what, what really pops out to me quite often is that um, much of the climate investment in the global south focuses really on two specific things, grid scale renewables and mass transport. And they're both really important, but they're really large ticket sized investments. And um, I feel that what's really underrated and what local communities actually need 
um, to participate in the energy transition. That's where the uh, that's really underrated. The small scale, small innovations, whether that's decentralized renewables, uh, micro mobility, energy efficiency. I think reaching the end user is the most important thing. Um, the most important innovation. I think that it, it needs to come there, and I feel like it has a an unintended co benefit, um, which is really amazing. Is that you're getting energy into people's faces, and that's really important because my conversation with bankers um, and financiers in India, especially, they, they're complaining that oh, we don't see EVs on the street. We don't want to finance EVs, but if you try to reach that local level if you get people to adopt more solutions i feel like you're really uh, you're making climate solutions such that they can never be ignored and i think that's what's really important here yeah, yeah that's a great point awesome um so we'll move into another question here uh what is your experience like navigating um the innovation and finance ecosystem as a, as an entrepreneur yourselves um or as kind of researchers um, what has that experience been like for you, um, especially kind of as young people um, entering into the space? Um, but Danny, also curious to hear kind of what was that experience like getting your first like round of funding to start um, to start New Energy Nexus and and what change what changes when there is funding to start really get getting the impact on the ground that you're looking to achieve? Well, New Energy Nexus is like 15 year old organization, so I. I fear sometimes our starting story, the genesis isn't that relevant, right. but you know, every every round of funding for companies we support and, and spin out, um, and you know, we've done hundreds in the last year is a challenge. And, and you know, as Kevin said, right at the top, this is the work a lot of entrepreneurs struggle around. I mean, an, an entrepreneur support organizations like ours need to bring the right kind of capital at the right time for the right stage of the development of the startup. And that's often a trick, you know, you might get offered equity at the wrong time, you know, to where you are and you'd be better off dealing with debt or a grant would be preferable, obviously, non-dilutive capital always is. So, um, you know, finding that Goldilocks moment with money is just, you know, the, the not too big, not too small, just right sort of dynamic is often a challenge. And again, having thought partners and groups like student energy and one another this com this comment that's come up a couple of times about going on the journey together young people bonding together to solve their own problems all these issues of the sdgs not just number seven but all of them related to climate will be the work of this generation you know and and hopefully able to tackle it at scale and going together and having capital resources that get to them just at the right time is one of the biggest challenges as well as the skills and the training and the demand from customers so it's it's complex but um i guess i'm trying to say the the journey is never easy um and yet uh one good bit of news is that the big end of town is coming after you and your little businesses i mean the last month has actually been historic in the world in that the international energy agency and the g7 and various others have sort of finally said, yeah, basta, no more fossil fuel financing. We can't do that anymore. You know, no more coal, certainly, and even oil and gas upstream is getting killed. And so there's no investment committee anywhere in the world with a fiduciary that can decide to invest in dirty energy anymore, which means there's hundreds of billions of dollars on the sidelines looking for places to go to work. We need hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact, trillions of dollars to go to work to solve climate at the scale and speed we need. But the problem, as identified here by this panel, is how do you get it to trickle down into these $5,000 chunks to a student at a university in the first year of their business, which is going to consume hundreds of millions of dollars over its life, but in its first go round needs a couple thousand to get the next prototype built or the next bit of business uh, financed. And, and that's where student energy and the fund that you're trying to raise the 150 million dollars you committed to over the decade is going to be critical getting it out there you know money's like water there's huge amounts of it in the atmosphere there's big oceans of it and banks there's there's rivers of it in different places but how do you get it in cups of water and, and streams at the scale that you need for small enterprises is really going to be a challenge of our time and coordinating that is is a big deal so just to say this is the right 
inquiry and we stand ready to support as much as we can with the funds we form and stand up and and the ways we deliver to entrepreneurs as much as we can with uh, we'd love to do that with you at student energy awesome yeah absolutely there's this piece around the knowledge sharing knowing what kind of money to even look for what type of money makes sense for you um and then also just moving the finance like we need to just get the finance into a place where it's accessible so um, our goal is that this this fund will do that. We'll start to do that, and you know, um, ultimately, I think the bigger goal is that it does just create kind of larger shifts in the finance landscape as well, where young people investing in young people. There's a business case for it. There's like a very clear, um, there's a very clear kind of return, whether that's through impact or real dollars in investing in young people, because it just it just makes sense at the end of the day. Um, awesome. And uh, I'm not sure. Does anybody else want to jump in on? Um, navigating the energy system as a young person right now, kind of what, what do you think will really change um, when we get funding in the hands of young people, um, either yourselves or kind of others that you've seen working in the space? Um, I want to add something here. I think that there's a misconception around um, people in the global south, but I think also in the global north saying that, oh, youth are the future. We need to talk about youth and uh, that's just not true. Youth is not the future, they're the present. I mean, India, the main age is 29. There's no better time to do this. And yet I've seen a lot of mainstream venture finance in my country uh, entirely rejecting climate. And there's a lot of um, corporates in energy, in clean energy, confessing at public events that they simply don't have the capacity and the capital to support young entrepreneurs. I've had this said to me. And this is where I think international climate finance is really important because you're helping, as, as already has been said, that you're helping build the confidence of existing investors in youth innovation, in energy, and you're getting them excited about the possibilities that it presents. Um, and given that currently only 10% of climate investment in India comes from international sources, I think every single additional dollar can help countries like us pave a completely new path. If I may also add a point, uh, just because uh, you were asking about our experience, you know, navigating innovation in the finance ecosystem. Now, putting the private sector aside and coming more to the international community, um, before, uh, before my current work today, I came from you know, the a youth led organization in Brazil and then went to work for the Inter-American Development Bank with climate change projects. And if there's one thing I learned from you know, trying to, to finance projects uh, in, in Brazil and climate change is that the existing uh, climate funds, they're very, very limited. And the criteria that they impose are very, um, are very like are, are always targeting the same type of organizations and obviously they will not be youth organizations so i remember working there and also being in the youth-led organization when they were like well should we try the the gcf the uh, uh, uh oh my god <laughs> the green climate fund sorry completely blacked out um so sh should we apply for the green, green climate fund and i was like no it's it's nearly impossible for like well-established organizations that have been in the sector for like 20 years to get funding from the green climate fund so imagine for like for youth so i think that um uh we definitely have to think of you know either creating a, a different stream for youth in these uh massive climate funds that are uh that are all international that it could be supporting youth and also thinking of the requirements because some of these requirements are so hard for you know like i said well established organizations so how can we attract more youth and you know even even the, the language is a barrier how can we make these requirements accessible to youth in different places um and also thinking of the gender components so like if we are to fund a project like we really need women to be part of the project. This is an important component that has been considered uh, in many types of funding, but that it should be something uh, that has to be present, you know, in these types of funds. So I think that as Denny was saying, we have an ocean of like money flowing all over the world. It's just about, you know, targeting the right people. And I don't think that, you know, the international community has been targeting youth. Absolutely. Yeah. And I can, I resonate with so much of that as somebody who spent the last four and a half years fundraising for a youth led organization as well. Like it's, it is pretty wild. Some of the things that you learn about and where the barriers exist. Like I've been told directly by development agencies that you, um, and this isn't to speak for all development agencies, but by one once, um, that you can only get funding through them if you've been funded by them before. So there's these like complete, you know, 
absolutely banana systems that we're expecting young people to just figure out how to navigate and all of these due diligence processes and what have you that nobody's really training anybody on. Um, so that's, I think, where, you know, again, this ecosystem side of it, where it's not just about putting money, creating a funding mechanism that has puts money in the hand of young people, but we're also working to kind of build up the um, financial literacy and like lexicon of how do development agencies or other types of funds talk about um, uh, talk about work in the space and how can you kind of align your own messaging to fit that. Um, it is, yeah, it's a... <laughs> It can feel a little uphill sometimes, but it's absolutely important. Awesome. So um, I'm not sure if there's any other thoughts on this question or we can move on to um, one of my last ones here is on the role of government. And so I'll bring this up because I think all of us are very familiar with, you know, the important role that government and policymaking um, has in our ability to achieve SDG 7 at scale. Um, but also because, uh, you know, as, as many of you know, um, Student Energy has been undertaking the first youth-led global research initiative to gather the perspectives of young people on the energy transition. And something that was really, really underscored in that research that I have just found um, wonderfully validating that young people really do know what they're talking about is uh, young people see policy and, and, you know, state leadership as both the biggest barrier and the biggest opportunity for, um, for achieving SDG 7 right now. Like policy, um, international policy making is just, you know, it's such a crucial piece of this, of this, um, of this picture. And so uh, I'm curious to hear from all of you, what is, what do you see as the role of government um, in this work and what should governments be committing to in making SDG 7 happen, but also supporting young people to build the skills that they need for our energy future and, um, you know, have access to decent work and all of those, you know, other co-benefit areas as well. It's not a small question, so. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me go first. So what I think from my own end, uh, uh, first of all, it's something I've seen, like in some old countries around, we have Ministry of uh, Environment, we have Ministry of Gender, we have Ministry of uh, Infrastructure. Even in my country, we have the Ministry of the Language We Speak, which is a good thing. But uh, like from all countries, I've never, it's like small countries you have like, Ministry of, of Business or Ministry of Startups, because these are the ones who are fueling like the, the economy of the country. So I want like to challenge uh, governments around. I know there are some governments which have like Ministry of, uh, of, of like startups of that ecosystem. I want to challenge them to create that, those ministry. I want to challenge them to not be read by a 57, 68 years old guy, to be read by 22, 25 years, because those are the people who are in that sector. That's like the first thing I will ask like for the government if I have an, an opportunity to talk to them. And the second thing, like from what like I'm a student, I've been a student, so I will never read a book or an article which has like 87 pages. I prefer to have some like things which are into, which can like I can see for a small time and get what I want to mean, what, what's going on. It's sad that like most of the rules and regulations which are outside here, it's not only for, for the, SDG 7 or any or other rules are piled into a 100 pages. I'm not going to take that time. I have social media to take to, to see. I have people to talk to. I'm not going to take like 1,000 pages to read all those. If there is a way they can put it in drawings, do some like mass communication everywhere, that would be good. And the last thing I think uh, that the government can do better, it's about stopping some, there are some like organizations which are created with the government, which are going to come and work as, an, as non-profits or NGOs. And they are making other business which are doing in that sector not make profits. I don't know if it makes sense. So they will come like, let's talk about an example of water. They'll come and be providing water for free. And those like NGO, if they can reach a time where they like their fund are over, but there are some startups which are through that process, which are not getting like, something through it because they have neglected their, their, their impact there. And people whom we are giving a service for free, they are not going to be open to even get that service for, for money. So if there is a way they can pull rules and regulations which facilitates these startups, not even bringing those nonprofit organization or bringing some organization from the government to have the monopoly in that sector, that would be amazing. Yeah, it's a great point, Kevin. Awesome. Uh, I can jump in just on 
you know, the role of government in supporting youthful entrepreneurs driving the transition we need this decade. It's it's kind of get in and get your hands dirty to governments. And, and to Kevin's point, the more, you know, youthful members of government roles uh, and bureaucracies and agencies and also the legislative and regulatory ranks of these things, probably the better because they'll roll with young people and their enthusiasm for solving their own futures um, not to put it on young people like in the future. I, I 100% agree with Isha. It's like the present in most of the places we're talking about, this needs to be done now. And the government's role is to help dynamize that market solution and get their sleeves rolled up. Um, you know, the, the kind of, when I was young, <laughs> the rhetoric around, governments are faceless bureaucrats that don't know anything and don't do anything of value. I think that's kind of been blown up. I mean, even in COVID with what have been mixed results in different countries, even represented here on this panel, but, you know, we have had some innovation at speed and scale with the vaccine development through R and D all the way to deployment with, you know, solar powered COVID fridges in communities in just a year or so, which is an historically rapid response to a public health threat. And that was a public private partnership that was led by smart actors in both sides of that, that supposed dichotomy. But, you know, the best of us has always been a case of collaboration between the state and, and private interests um, and, and working that out uh, and using markets sometimes to deliver efficiently and sometimes not. Um, is key. So the, the sort of model of mixing it together, I think is, is the way. And the good news is, you know, from like um, the United States, which has been better or worse, a dominant country in many of these conversations, the, the era of big government is over, which was sort of the mantra of Reaganomics is over, you know, and Bidenomics is all about government's going to get involved again. And a lot of other countries, you're seeing that. And again, COVID has kind of caused us to realize the state can reach in and shut down sectors of the economy and stop people moving and tourism and travel and all sorts of things. And if we can do that, well, then we can lean in and we can uplift whole sectors of the economy like energy access, entrepreneurship and electric mobility solutions in the cities of Asia and Africa and, and all these things. So the state needs to sort of take its its responsibility. And now that it's been freed to do it by example in the pandemic, I think it's a really exciting time. It, it does, however, need to grapple with all these things that have been mentioned, which is how they bust their own bureaucratic mindset and learn how to work with young people in their numbers and coming up and how they get money down to $5,000 grants that will make or break an entrepreneur trying to get out there. and that is not going to be done through the usual channels and the the you know the silly things that like you described of you only get funding if you've been funded by us before i mean what madness is that <laughs> that's going to cause the world to end in hell in a handbasket we have to challenge ourselves and work out how to work with wonderful young people who are going to be the solution in the places that the solution is needed which is why again i'm just so happy to be working with Student Energy and, and launching this movement and this fund to get you all the capital and the, the other non-financial capital that you need to succeed. Absolutely. Yeah, Eduardo, please. Sorry, I think uh, just to add, because now we're, we got to the point that I mentioned before about government regulation. I think that, first of all, uh, I think a lot of countries still don't have like a concrete framework for entrepreneurship, the do's and don'ts. So I think that the first step is like making this concrete into a law. And the ones that have, and then I mentioned my country in Brazil, um, I think it's, uh, it's very complicated because it's not only bureaucratic, but it's counterproductive because there barely are any incentives for, for early stage uh, enterprises. So it's really hard as a young person who sometimes is in college or even before college or after college, you usually don't have funds, like usually your family can't support you. It's so hard to have access to funding that you need a lot, again, a lot of requirements. And then uh, coming back to the US example, like for me living now that I'm living here, it's interesting to see that, for example, fi uh, foundations, you know, to receive like tax exemptions, they have to donate to a certain type of organization. And I think that that's like, that's incredible. Like from where I come from, if all like 
foundations and you know organizations that had like uh, a specific amount of money had to donate you know like it's, it's like mandatory uh for the law to donate to to smaller organizations i think that's already a huge incentive but also tax exemptions like i was saying it's so hard like in the first six months of your business you have to pay so much to the government that it already doesn't make sense to, to, to create a, a, an enterprise and then the second point would be even to the point to the extent that uh, issuing a patent in my country takes between seven to ten years so even if you're being innovative uh, in this area you have to be aware that it will take a while and you have to like endure uh, financially, like 10 years of maybe seeing or not your innovation being, you know, uh, receiving the, the patent. So I think that there's a lot of things that still have to be better. And then just the final point that I would bring is the now that we're, we're seeing the high level dialogue on energy uh, happening after almost 40 years and a lot of governments are making very bold pledges. I think it's just important to also bring the importance of uh, of committing to a just energy transition because we see a lot of commitments related to the you know decarbonizing the sector, phasing out coal, which is great and necessary, but we always also have to you know keep an eye on the people who really are losing and are more vulnerable. So my country specifically, you know, bolder commitments to indigenous people and rural communities uh, that will be affected by these decisions. And all over the world, when I say this, uh, we at SC for all we discuss a lot about, you know, divesting from, from fossil fuels and how can can how will that impact, you know, countries that have their whole GDP based on fossil fuels, or even, you know, um, uh, when we talk about clean cooking, which we're still trying to like transition from women, you know, burning, uh, biomass and like breathing in that terrible air that is bad for their health and like how how can we bring uh, natural gas to their homes so I think that we we have to keep in mind that SDG 7 is about uh, not leaving anyone behind so I think that governments have also to also need to consider that in their decisions both to finance developing countries but also in like how are they commitments considering the most vulnerable people Yeah, really well said and um, and a great place to close off. Isha, I'm not sure if you had any last thoughts on this as well, but happy to <laughs> move us on into last messages as well. Awesome. So maybe I'll then turn it to each of you. If you have a final last message for the audience today on um, launching the youth solutions movement, on achieving SDG 7 by 2030, um, we would love to hear a final closing message from you. Um, I will do a final call to action at the very end as well, um, and then uh, hand it back over to Meredith um, to close us off today. Um, so whoever wants to jump in with a final message. Look, I'll do it because I know you won't be as gratuitous as I can be to plug your own um, ideas. Uh, so my message and New Energy Nexus is thought for the audience is if you can get involved with student energy, um, the funders and foundations and multilaterals out there, please take a meeting with these, this team because the ideas of the solutions movement being launched and the fund to support youth entrepreneurs, the greenpreneurship program they've been running is really inspiring. Uh, if you haven't been to the student energy summit, which you probably haven't, if you've only just met them in the last year or so because of COVID, get there when you can or get involved online. I went in 2019 and was just blown away as you've seen by the incredible caliber of this panel. There's tens of thousands of students in student energy thinking, doing and working on these solutions here now that we need in the next seven, eight years. We're talking about 2030, getting this done. These are the people gonna do it. So if you're a funder, please, um, sit down with student energy and, and do what you can to get them what they need to scale this program and this solutions movement. So thanks, Danny. Yeah, I want to add like a, a final thing. So for me, like there's something founders neglect, which is all about kindness and keeping in touch with your, 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 your network. So I was one of the team like uh, for the green printers like last year. And the funny thing, we didn't win, but luckily we stayed the com like communicating with student energy and everything. And they have been so helpful in certain ways. 
there's a lot I have learned through this. And it's not a matter of winning or a matter of getting funds. It's a matter of even the connection you are going to have. If I, I have like after the program, like decided to even keep quiet and go there and continue my business, I wouldn't even have like this opportunity to talk to people. Maybe here there's someone who might be going to even reach out to me, uh, invest or be my customer, uh, whatever. But like on the other end, it's all about the community you're building. It's not all about the profits. It's all about people you surround with, yourself with and the, how hard you push for the opportunities. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, uh, my, my final message would be maybe since we discussed a lot about, you know, uh, youth entrepreneurship and finance would be the importance of scholarships. So again, if donors and funders are listening, I think that uh, I was pursuing my master's this year and it's so stressful to, you know, see how much you have to pay and how much is going to be impossible for you. And the fact that, you know, sometimes you'll need to, to have a loan in, in the US dollars in my case, which will compromise your future and your future goals in the energy sector. So if we're really talking about, you know, how can we, um, how can we support, uh, youth entrepreneurs, we have to think about their education. So it's so hard to already, you know, decide that you want to enter the energy sector, especially for women. And then once you're there, you have to receive training because it's really hard to get in the sector without having the proper proper technical training. And once you're there, you see barely no, you know, scholarships dedicated to the energy sector. And it's again, really hard. And I say this not only for the global south, because, you know, the, the, the gap is even larger, but also even for the global north, it's just so hard to see, you know, opportunities for young people that want to be in the energy sector. And again, you know, the, the capacity building component is so important, not only for like local communities, but how do we take people uh, both, you know, in rural and urban communities to schools to learn, you know, about the energy sector. So I think that that will be, you know, and we don't talk a lot about that, but it's in the Paris Agreement to discuss you know, climate education. And I think that energy is a big component in that, uh, that, in that area. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great point, yeah. Eduardo. I don't, think, I don't think I'm going to be as eloquent as the others, but I think one thing that I want to say is just about embracing failure. Um, because I feel like one reason why funding is so difficult uh, from both the investor's point of view, but also the entrepreneur's point of view is because there's a fear of failure. Um, entre uh, entrepreneurs are f scared of failing and investors are scared of their fund, their, uh, their investments failing. But I feel like the kind of skills that you build when you fail and the kind of uh, lessons you learn, they're going to be valuable in any case. And they're going to be really important for us to scale the kind of uh, solutions that we need for climate goals. So uh, I think that's just the message I want to leave with personally. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great way to close this off. And thank you all so much for such a great discussion. This was, um, this was just so wonderful to participate in myself. And I'm so excited to be kind of getting into the next phase of what launching the solutions movement will really look like. Um, we do have a call to action for all of you and your communities as well, your networks, um, to put the word out there. Um, but maybe I'll hand it over to Meredith at this point um, to wrap us up and, uh, and close out this panel discussion. So thank you all so much. Meredith, over to you. Yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd specifically love to thank Danny for all of your support and mentorship so far and guidance. Um, Isha, Eduarda, and Kevin, each of you are written into our compact in various ways based on things that you've shared with us through our programs. And, and Helen has always been a driving force beyond behind all of it. So thank you all so, so much for your contributions. And also thank you to the whole team at Student Energy. There's there's a big group of people, um, both in our network and on our staff, who have been driving this forward. And um, we really couldn't do it without them or without any of the youth leadership that we've seen. And even from our founding days of, of trying to talk about sustainability in Calgary um, many moons ago. So um, the last thing I'll leave you with is what this panel has really inspired me on is really um, empowering young people, funding their ideas, and then providing that ecosystem of support through mentorship, coaching, capacity building, inside and outside of the formal education system is really how we play the long game on the energy transition. This is how we set up the next cohort of energy leaders to know each other, support each other, and to drive deployment forward in their communities. And it's really how we bake this in to consumers and voters from here to 2050 throughout their careers and their lifetimes. So 
Um, I'd encourage you to take a meeting with us, come be inspired, as apparently we have inspired Danny to devote all of his free time to hanging out with us lately, and, um, and really come learn about why you need to take the chance on young people and um, be willing to step into the space of, of trying new things to increase our deployment and set us up to achieve SDG 7 by the end of 2030. Thank you all so much for coming, and we look forward to working with you further on the solutions movement. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.